Hello and welcome back to the alphabet of astronomy. So today it's brought to you by the letter J. And J is for jeans instability. <laughs> and now we're not talking about your favorite pair of denim and how they may or may not fit after COVID. <laughs> jeans instability is actually about how stars form. Now we've talked about this on my channel before, but basically stars form out of these giant molecular clouds where they start to collapse and form protostars within this cloud. But why do they collapse? What causes that collapse? This is what the genes instability deals with. So using the genes criterion for the genes instability, we can calculate what's called the genes mass and the genes length. This is a lot of genesing, but this is all named after the uh, British physicist, Sir James Jeans, who first investigated this back in the very early 20th century. Now this was one of the first analyses done for this. So it made a lot of simplifying assumptions and neglected some effects like rotation, galactic magnetic fields and turbulence within the cloud. But it gives us a good starting point to talk about the collapse of protostars in a giant molecular cloud. So initially, the giant molecular cloud is going to be in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. And basically what this means is that the force of gravity pulling inward is balanced by the push of pressure pushing outward, and so the cloud is basically static, it doesn't move, it doesn't collapse, it doesn't expand. Now in order for this to happen, we know by something called the Virial Theorem that the negative potential energy, which comes from the gravity, has to be equal to twice the kinetic energy of the basic, basically the particles within the cloud, you know, moving around, having kinetic energy. So if these two energies are balanced in hydrostatic equilibrium, then in order to cause gravitational collapse, we need to put it out of balance a little bit and make the gravity kind of win out. So the potential energy needs to become slightly more negative than that kinetic energy. Now there's some math associated with this, um, which I'd be happy to go over with you, but I'm guessing that's not why you're here. <laughs> as much fun as it would be for me. So let's just talk qualitatively. So basically we know that gravity gets stronger as you have more mass and it gets weaker as your objects get farther apart. So basically as the mass of the cloud increases, that potential energy gets more negative. And as the radius of the cloud increases, that potential energy gets less negative. The kinetic energy depends both on the mass of the particles that are involved and also on the temperature of the cloud. Because particles with a higher temperature are going to be moving more and have more kinetic energy. Now, if you have a cloud of a given density, there's a relationship between the mass and the radius of the cloud, right? Because density is just, um, the mass over the volume and the volume is based on the radius. So we can take that radius dependence on gravity and kind of change that into also being a mass dependence for a given density. And so basically once you put all that together and then solve for the critical mass at which the potential energy becomes more negative than that double the kinetic energy. So basically the critical mass at which gravity will start to win out. We find basically that it depends on two properties of the cloud, the temperature and the density of the cloud. So this critical mass increases as the temperature increases and it decreases as the density increases. So they're kind of opposite effects. Temperature increases, increases the critical mass or the genes mass and density increasing lowers the genes mass. This is a little bit counterintuitive. So that's uh, kind of arises out of basically this radiance, radius and how it depends on the density and the mass. Just how we use density to kind of turn that radius into a mass, we could do the opposite thing and basically look at what that mass would be in terms of radius based on a given density. And so then we can find basically the minimum radius that is required for the gravitational energy to win out and for collapse to begin. This is called the genes length. And again, we find that the critical radius, so the genes length increases as mass, excuse me, as temperature increases, although it's less strongly dependent on the temperature than the critical mass and has the same dependence on the density. Now this was just kind of a um, basic energy balance problem that we looked at, but you could also look at the genes instability in a different way in terms of time scales of perturbations within the cloud. Because even a cloud that's in hydrostatic equilibrium, there's going to be small fluctuations and changes. So for the change in pressure, for a small change in pressure to basically propagate through the cloud, it depends on the speed of sound. So pressure waves basically move at the speed of sound. So the characteristic time scale of that is going to depend on the distance that it has to travel, so the size of the cloud, and the speed of sound within the cloud. Conversely, there's something called the free fall time associated with gravity, which basically says how fast um, a small change in gravity or, or how it would free fall in. <laughs> 
I'm not explaining this well, but basically those are the two different time scales. One is based on the speed of sound and one is based on the free fall time. Now, if that free fall time scale is shorter than that uh, pressure propagation time scale, then the cloud will collapse because basically gravity is faster than in that case. And so gravity will start to win out because it will, it kind of snowballs, right? Once it starts to collapse, it continues to collapse more. So when the free fall time is less than that speed of sound times the distance you're interested in, then you get into the same sort of situation where you could have a collapse. This also has a bunch of math associated with it. And if you work out that math, you'll find the exact same thing, that this gene's mass depends on the temperature and the density, and that the um, gene's length also depends on the temperature and density, and that they are inversely related with the temperature and the density. So what does all this mean? <laughs> Besides being just a bunch of very fun math. What this means is that the colder and denser a given portion of a cloud is, the more unstable it is to collapse. This means that it can collapse at smaller masses. And so therefore it would create smaller stars. These very massive stars then must be formed in the hot and less dense regions of the cloud. And so it might sound counterintuitive that you get more massive stars from less dense material. It's just because gravity is weaker with that less dense material. So you need to go farther in order to get enough mass to be um, unstable basically. And so you have a lot of mass required to become unstable. And so, <laughs> so yeah, so to get a massive star, you need hot, less dense material. And then small stars form out of the cold, more dense material because that really wants to collapse very easily and so you don't need a lot of mass to trigger that collapse. Now like I said, the genes instability is a very simplified model. It ignores several important factors, plus there's this whole thing called the genes swindle, which I'm not even going to get into, but it's actually surprisingly useful and gives us a good understanding of the very basic ways in which protostars form within a giant molecular cloud. It's been over a century and we still use it. <laughs> so there you have it. That was the genes instability. I hope you learned a little bit of something and I hope you will join us for the letter K. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time. Bye.